Atari Jaguar fans rejoice. Developer Rich Whitehouse has created the first ever Atari Jaguar emulator with 100% perfect compatibility with the entire Jaguar library. I'm about to teach you everything it takes to get the new Big P emulator set up and running on your Windows-based PC so that you can play your Jaguar games your way. This is normally the part of the video where I excitedly declare that you can download the latest version of the software right on their website. But I think there's an important message here that needs to be delivered as well. At the exact same time that Rich created this emulator, he's also fighting and losing his battle with cancer. We have an incredible community of retro gamers here on this channel. If we can all bond together and help Rich out, even just a little, I believe we can make a positive impact on his life in the same way he's made a positive impact on ours. I've become one of Rich's patrons and I hope that you'll consider doing the same. By adding value to Rich's life, we add value and purpose to all of our lives together. All right, once you've visited Rich's Patreon page, you can scroll down and get to the download section to grab the latest version of the emulator. Click the download link shown here to download the zip file to your computer. Along with the emulator itself, it's absolutely worth downloading the marquee files for the emulator. It uses the same freely distributable marquee files that are used with the Atari Jaguar's game drive or multi-game cart. You can download these files from the Atari Age website from the link in the video description. I've staged some Atari Jaguar ROM files in the downloads folder along with the two zip files that we previously downloaded. Go ahead and extract both of the zip files in your downloads folder. You can extract them to their default paths. We'll deal with the path locations in just a moment. Once you have these two files uncompressed, delete the zip files to eliminate clutter. All right, let's slow the roll for just a moment so I can point out something important here. For the marquee images or box images to display correctly inside the emulator, the names of the game ROMs and the names of the files for the marquees have to be a perfect match. The first game ROM shown here is a perfect example of what I mean. It's listed as air cars with a space between the two words. But watch what happens when you compare it to the listing for the marquees. When you go into the marquee folder you uncompressed, take a look here. I've actually renamed all of the marquee files except for this one because I want to point this out to you. See how one of these files has air cars as one word and the other has air cars as two words? The one with two words will match, but the one with one word will not. Therefore, the marquee would not display on the one where the file name does not match the file name of the ROM. I just wanted to belabor this point because you need to make absolutely certain that the file names between the ROMs and the marquees match, and they probably won't when you download the marquee file set. So to get all of these to display correctly, you'll have some renaming to do. Once you've verified the file names match between your game ROMs and your marquees, you'll need to copy all of the marquee files into the same folder that has your game ROMs. To facilitate this here, I'm just going to use the Control A function to mark all of the files, then right click on one of them and select copy from the list of menu choices. All right, I'll go back one listing in the navigation structure to go back to downloads into the ROMs folder. And from here, I'm just going to click outside of the list of ROMs and click paste from the list of choices. Here's a tip to make sure you've got all of the file naming done correctly. From inside File Explorer, go up to the top and click on Sort. Sort these files by name, and both your ROM files and your marquee files will be lined up one next to the other. For example, here you can see the aircars.mrq file and the aircars.zip file both match. Now you can back up the marquee files or just delete them since you have them already copied over to the ROM folder. And just to keep everything neatly packed together, I'm going to go ahead and grab the ROMs folder with the marquees in it and just drag and drop it into the main emulator folder. Let's go ahead and fire up the emulator for the first time. Double click into the folder, then locate the bigpemu.exe file and double click on it. When you launch the emulator, you'll be greeted with this Jaguar BIOS style splash screen with the name of the emulator and the name of the developer, Rich Whitehouse. To go forward to the main menu, press the enter key on your keyboard. When you first go into the emulator's main menu, you'll be on the system menu in a sub menu that says load cartridge. You can do that, but here's what I recommend that you do first. Press the escape key to go back one level in the menu. If you're planning to use an external controller, scroll down to input and select it with the enter button. To configure an external controller, use the arrow keys to scroll down one listing in the menu until you get to input device one. Press enter here to continue. From the list of sub menu choices shown here, Use the down arrow key on the keyboard to scroll down until you get to Set Bindings and select this with the Enter button. What you'll find here is there are already keys on your keyboard bound to the various controls for the Jaguar controller. Even if you don't plan to use an external controller, it's helpful to review these so that you know which keys on the keyboard do what things with your Jaguar controller. 
I recommend against using the set all function. Instead, I recommend that you bind these one at a time so that you have granular control over how these things are being configured. Here's how that's done. For example, here's the C button. It's already configured to use the A button on the keyboard. To bind a controller button to the C button for the Jaguar controller, make sure that you've highlighted add and press the enter key. Then you can press the corresponding button on your controller that you want to map to the C button on the Jaguar controller. In this case, I'm using a Microsoft Xbox controller paired to Windows 11. You can see now that both A on the keyboard and X on the controller both represent button C on the Jaguar controller. Now you can scroll down and map the other buttons and D-pad functions on the Jaguar controller. And take note, every time you move down through the list, the Jaguar's tail moves and points to the corresponding function on the controller. Alright, once you have all of the action buttons and D-pad functions mapped for the Jaguar controller, let's take a look at the number pad. Out of the box, the emulator already has the number pad for the Jaguar mapped to the number pad on your keyboard. And if you don't have a number pad, you can just use the numbers across the top of the keyboard. You can also map the number pad for the Jaguar to your connected controller by first selecting a button on the controller to represent the keypad press. For example, here, to represent the zero press on the Jaguar keypad, I'm going to use the A button on the Xbox controller. To differentiate this from the original A press, I'm also going to set a hold button press. In this example, I'm going to add the left trigger as a hold command, so that you have to press the left trigger first, then the A button to activate the zero button. Now you can see that the left trigger is required to be pressed before the A button is pressed to represent zero on the number pad. Just like the action buttons in the D-pad, go ahead and configure all of the number pad functions to the controller in the way that you see fit. As a recommendation here, you'll probably want to use the same hold button for all of the numeric pad functions on the Jaguar controller. Once you have all of the number pad functions mapped, you also have the option of mapping the analog sticks on your controller if the controller supports them. Certain games like Tempest 2000 support rotary controls and analog controls will give you that option. The Xbox controller doesn't have any extra up functions, so the task here is done. To lock in the changes, press Escape, then press Escape again to go back one level in the submenus. We'll take a look at the native Jaguar emulation performance, but I also want to show you a way that Rich himself recommends in order to increase performance. Press Escape to go back to the submenus until you get to the System main menu. Select it with the Enter button, then scroll down to the submenu listing that says Settings and select it with the Enter button. On a side note here, now that you've mapped your controller, you can also use it to navigate the menu structure. One of the nifty things about this emulator is you can actually virtually overclock the two sets of chips inside the Jaguar. One of them being the reduced instruction set chips, and the other being the Motorola 68000 chip. But Rich recommends instead of doing overclocking, which can produce some degree of instability, to change the blitter setting instead. In summary, the blitter is basically just a part of a chip that deals with graphics, primarily bitmaps. Change this setting from default to free and you'll see some significant performance improvements all the way up to 60 frames per second in some cases. You can either press escape to go back several levels in the menu system or just use your connected controller. Scroll down in the listings to video and either select it with enter on the keyboard or your controller. This is where the 4K magic happens. Scroll down in the submenu settings to the listing for resolution. Here you can change it from the default 800 by 600 all the way up to the glorious 4K of 3840 by 2160. Scroll to it in the menus and select it with enter or with your connected controller. This will probably be the only thing you'll need to change in the video section. You can either escape out of it or use your connected controller to go back to the main menu. Alright, you've put in the legwork. You ready to play some Jag? Here we go. Go up to System and select it with enter or with your controller. You remember that listing for load cartridge that we saw when we first launched the emulator? It's time. Go to Load Cartridge and select it. You'll need to tell the emulator where your ROMs are located. In this case, I've already copied them over right into the emulator folder in a subfolder called Atari Jaguar. So in this case, I'll just navigate to the Jaguar subfolder and select it from the list. Here you'll find the list of games that are available to play. You'll also find whatever marquee artwork you copied over inside the ROM folder represented here as well, along with some basic information about the games listed above the marquee art. All right, let's check out the two Jaguar games we all love the most, AVP and Tempest 2000. This is AVP playing as the Colonial Marine. In this instance, there's no acceleration, the blitter is set to normal, and the game is playing at 100% perfect emulation and perfect speed, just like it would be playing on a real Jaguar. And here it is with the blitter freed. 
In this case, the speed and performance difference isn't significant, but it is noticeable. But in both of these cases, it's being presented here in glorious 4K. But the real win on the blitter side of things comes from games like Tempest 2000 that can take full advantage of the blitter being freed up. This is Tempest 2000 running at its normal speed with perfect emulation. Even in its stock form, Tempest 2000 is one of the premier experiences on the Atari Jaguar. Alright, I slowed the video down here to 10% so that you could see the frames moving frame by frame. Every time you see a frame move, it's actually 1 30th of a second. So it's actually 30 frames per second of video in its stock emulation form. But check this out. Here's Tempest 2000 on the exact same stage running with the blitter set to free. It's running at a buttery 60 frames per second. And when I slowed the video down to 10% in the editor this time, what I found is every 1 60th of a second, there's a frame change. That means that the game's playing indeed at the buttery smooth 60 frames per second through the emulator. Tight! Hey, did you know that you can also play GameCube and Wii games through emulation on your PC? Check this out. I've got this great video showing you how to use the Dolphin emulator, and it's shown here on screen and linked in the video description and pinned comment. See you there.